Hello everybody, I'm Daryl Crow. I'd like to give you a special welcome if this is your first time viewing one of our video tips. And if you're a returnee, thank you so much in trusting us. I'm Daryl Crow, as I said, and each week I like to answer beginning art students' questions on oil painting and acrylic painting and water mixable painting. And always as ever, ever so unfaithful, is my good compadre, Joe Kaczynski. Hey, Daryl, how are you doing today? I'm doing just ducky. And hello to all our students out in Learn to Paint Land. How are you guys doing today? No, Joe, do we have any questions to get us started? We actually have three of them. Wow. And the first one is from Paul Perro from Pennsylvania. And he says, I am a member of your Lifetime Club, and needless to say, I enjoy doing your landscapes and seascapes. I believe that I have had your course for about two months, and I'm getting better, but I still have a long way to go before I feel real confident in my ability. I know that you do not offer videos in still life other than florals. However, I would like to attempt painting these in oil, but I have an awful time with the proper placement of shadows and use of appropriate color variations and tones on the fruit. For example, apples, lemons, and pears, etc. As an example, I realize that lemons have several variations of yellows as well as greens. Some are lighter and some are darker, and I simply cannot seem to get the proper color tones of blending without making it look like a blob. Can you help me in this area? We certainly can. We actually have put together a couple of uh, uh, videos since your question came in that I think you're going to find especially helpful. One was on actual object placement. And, uh, and if you have a photo that you're referencing, even if what you've done is put together your own still life creation, taking a photograph and now you're trying to move what's on a four by six photo to uh, an 18 by 24 canvas, where should these objects reside? And we have a, a, a video on that and a calculator that you can use for that. And if you're interested in that, you can go to www. Uh, DarylCrow.com slash YouTube and there you'll be able to see some of the free down offers, download offers that we have which includes the uh, uh, calculator along with a video instruction on how to use it. For color mixing, since you're a lifetime club member, look at the color mixing uh, videos we have there. We have one on how to mix colors, how to design with colors, and also how to choose which colors to use on a painting along with some example. One part of your question really is critical and that is how can I actually design a still life that is going to be pleasing to the people that I am painting for or for myself. The best answer I've ever heard in my life came from uh, uh, art instructor Jesse Martin and he said to me, he said, Daryl, when you study still life, don't try to reinvent the wheel. What you do is take a look at what's already been done. Even go take a look at what the old masters have done. And then what you do is you get your own objects, the fruits, the dishes, uh, the violins and everything, and you place them in the same manner that you saw those award-winning masterpieces. So you have your own creation in front of you. And then you can change whatever you want. You can take a lamp and put light on it in different areas. And then you take a photograph of it and you paint that. Wow. Did we just have an earthquake? <laughs> certainly felt that way, didn't it? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're just going to go ahead and leave that in. It's an exciting world out here, isn't it, folks? Anything can happen anytime. And so, Joe, do we have a next question? Yes, we do. And this one is from Malvidi. Malvida, I'm sorry. Hi, Daryl. I have a question. Can I use acrylic varnish to varnish my oil painting? And how long should I wait for my painting to dry? Because many artists have different opinions. Can I hear yours? Thank what? you, by the way, for sending me emails with very good tips. Well, you're, you're certainly welcome, and um, uh, by acrylic sprays, I think what you're saying is you're looking for sprays to go over oil painting, and what I would suggest you do is you go down to the art store and have their, 
those people suggest to spray to you. The average length of time for uh, letting your paintings dry is one to two years. Uh, most uh, manufacturers of these sprays will say, do not paint this for the first year. You see what happens is that uh, oil paints dry from the canvas level out. And so, but a film forms over, okay, the surface in uh, a week or two. And so therefore, it's a constant drying process. So you need the surface open long enough so that the core of the paints can dry. And so that's why they ask you not to paint and spray for the first year or so. The second thing is that there are some manufacturers who make uh, varnish sprays that you can spray on while it's wet and you can even touch up your painting and then go on. There are not many of them, but there are a few of them. So my basic uh, advice is if you're beginning to paint, don't worry about it. If you're a long time student and you're starting to sell your work, or you want to preserve your work for your grandchildren, then by all means, go ahead and spray after a year or so. All right, and our final question is from, oh, Brenda from Monterey, California. Monterey. Yes. I love Monterey, Joe. I used to live there for four months. I kind of figured you'd appreciate this one. And her question is, what is underpainting? You mentioned it in last week's video tips. Ah, uh, yes I did. I'm guilty, aren't I, Joe? Well, you sure are. See, you open up that Pandora's box every time you open your mouth. Yeah, I guess I do. But you know what? That's a, that is an important concept for people to understand, especially if they're doing uh, wildlife or pet life or tame life or no life. And uh, the, the thing that underpainting does is uh, it forms a base underneath other colors that we're going to lay over. And because we like to lay over more translucent colors, it helps to define deeper values of those colors. Now, all that means is, is that uh, we have two things to be concerned with. When we do the underpainting of a, for example, if you look behind me, I, I have a uh, German Shepherd here that I've done an underpainting for, Joe. And uh, you remember Hazel? Oh, yes. Yeah, well, Hazel, uh, this is her dog, Sheba. And I did a painting, and I did two or three versions of it so to find out which one she liked. This wasn't the one she liked. She liked a different one. But in any event, um, Hazel, unfortunately, uh, has cancer. And uh, she was feeling pretty blue uh, for a week, you know, undergoing all that chemotherapy that they have to go through. And I thought I'd cheer her up. And so what I did is I put together a little painting. Now, when you do a painting, especially of a pet, Joe, yep. you have to underpaint it. And you're looking for dark values for the color. And you want to be able to uh, uh, have light values where lighter colors. Now, this German Shepherd does not have much white in it. It's mostly different tans and black, a lot of black. So that's where I put a lot of the uh, burnt umber. I do all my underpaintings in burnt umber. And I will sometimes coat the canvas first with uh, a light uh, color to begin with. Like with a lot of animals, I'll underpaint with yellow ochre as I did with this particular canvas. Some of them I underpaint with a, a more reddish brown one or some people call it pink, it's called terracotta. And I get the cheapest uh, underpainting acrylic I can. They're like 40 cents a bottle. You just don't get much uh, uh, cheaper than that because that's about, that'll do a half a dozen paintings anyway. But you coat that, okay, and you let that dry thoroughly. And then what you do is you get a photograph right here and you go ahead and start to paint. And you put the darks, I always like to start with the darks and then I go lighter. Now you want to make sure, I use a very, very lean medium when I do this. And, and a lean means it dries quickly. And then what I do is wherever I do all the darks, wherever I see the darkest dark, which is generally the nose, the mouth, and the uh, eyes. And then I will go ahead and do parts of the bodies that either in deep shadow and I do not want to put this on solid. I got carried away here, but this is one of the darkest shadows. And uh, you want to go ahead and, and lighten, 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 okay? 
So that's pretty much what underpainting is. Now, what's the value of doing underpainting? I don't want to just leave you with, oh, that's what underpainting is, and then you decide whether or not you should do it. What I want to leave you with is why you're doing it. So let me show you another dog which I am working on applying color to, and it's a Boston Terrier. Okay, this is um, the second phase. Okay, you saw the first phase, which was the underpainting. This uh, Boston Terrier is now, and his name is Max, by the way. He looks like a Max, doesn't he, Joe? Oh, he sure does. If I was ever going to have a Boston Terrier looking like this, he would be Max. <laughs> Okay, and you want to say, nice, Mac, nice, Mac. Anyway, um, if you take a look right in here, you see that underpainting is coming through. So all I had to do was paint this white, and my underpainting is coming through. You see that? So you, down here, you see the shadow underneath the uh, dog's head, and you don't lose your shadows. You don't use your light, lose your lights and your darks. That's the value of underpainting. And, and that means you could put thinner coats of paint on your dog as you build them through the four steps that I like to use. Now, uh, people always say, well, what are the four steps of the pet portrait that you like to do? The first one is uh, preparing and underpainting, okay? And the second step is adding color. The third step is the face and fur and hair and the fourth step is the final detail. Now, sometimes I can do both the collar and the face and uh, fur, as I call it, steps together. But that really depends on how much time you have. But the main important thing is that underpainting shows right up through each of the steps. Now, this is after step two. Let me show you a Pomeranian where I've gone through the entire step. Now we can see some of the facial features that have been preserved because of the underpainting can still be seen through that. And you constantly reinforce where the underpainting is with grays and other colors that match the uh, uh, pet portrait that you're working with. Now this dog is a Pomeranian. His, uh, her name is Daytona. And do you remember Cherie? Yes, of course. Cherie is a great student of ours, and uh, she wanted to paint her little puppy, so we went ahead and spent a few weeks uh, working at her uh, leisure. And uh, she so enjoyed this, and she, you know what, Joe? What? She was an absolute beginner. She had only done two or three paintings, and then when she did, which she f posted on her Facebook account, she went ahead and got a lot of rave reviews. Nobody would believe that on her third or fourth painting in her whole entire life, she could paint a pet. I think it's just a matter of having the right information and good knowledge. So anyway, uh, you can see all along here how these different uh, underpainting areas that we produced in the original uh, step shows through all the way through the entire process of painting the pet. So that's what underpainting is. Now, if you're a lifetime member, which I seem to think you are, uh, go take a look at our wildlife series. What you'll see is the very first step in each of those was an underpainting. So I think you've got a lot of world of excitement ahead of you if you decide to incorporate underpainting in your paintings. It works great for uh, people. It works great for animals. On, on uh, landscapes and seascapes, I don't use that step at all. Okay, so Joe, that was a great question. And that was the last question. Well, let's go fishing. All we'll right. see you tomorrow with the big trout. <laughs> this is Daryl Crow, and this is Joe Kaczynski. And yes, you can paint. <laughs>